purple robe here, and as you can see, I changed up the scenery behind me. I am now in bed recording. You can't stop me. Anyway, you're about to start chapter one of a book where I first dabbled in comedy. It's comedy. It's fantasy. There's a bunch of weird, funny, wacky characters. They're all searching for a magical hat that could be the key to ending the world as we know it. Check out chapter one of Madcap right now. And where the hell am I? Thought Callie, and not for the first time. He was here, wherever here was, and that was more than he could say for Malcolm or Ed Harwood. Where the hell were they? Callie didn't know, and although in some corner of his mind he knew he cared, he didn't give a flying rat's ass as to their whereabouts at that particular moment. Where the hell am I? He hated walking through sand. He knew that. The grains got everywhere, in his boots, in his clothes. They stuck to his damp, sweaty skin and fell from his bleach-blonde, sun-streaked hair when he shook his head. Too much sand. It consumed his entire view. Was he in a desert? Or just a really large beach? He couldn't remember, but he saw no hint of water. His muscles ached from walking. The sand was loose, and his feet sank in with every step, making it all the more difficult to walk through. His eyes were closed, yet he continued traveling forward, the sun roasting him like meat on a spit. He had a hat, lined with a towel which hung to his shoulders protecting the sides of his face, as well as the back of his neck from the fierce penetrating rays of the sun, but that hat was long gone. He had lost it even before he had lost Ed Harwood. Where was that? Barbank? Kelly couldn't remember. His strength was ebbing. He could feel it, like slowly losing chips in a poker game, only now it seemed that he was gaining that money, having to add it coin by coin to a loaded bag that dragged him deeper and deeper into the sand. Somewhere in the distance he heard music, or was that in his head? He was beginning to think that he may be losing his sanity. Kelly knew that the heat could have that effect. He wondered if it might not be better, as his body gradually gave out to allow his mind to slip out the back door. Malcolm had laughed when Kelly had lost his hat. He recalled that sound now, so pleasant and infectious. He wondered if Malcolm was laughing now, wherever he was, or even if he was still alive and able to laugh. Walking and walking and... Where the hell am I? The song, he realized, was Cashmere. He was quite sure of that, even though its origin was still a mystery. Trekking as he was, with that Zeppelin tune booming around him, just seemed right to Kelly. He made a conscious decision to keep walking until the song ended, then rest. He needed water. Water, sleep, and food. Ha! <laughs> what a joke. There were certainly no restaurants near, and to stop moving for even ten minutes in this place was dangerous. There were things out here who could sense when you stopped moving, things that wanted to eat you. But Kelly's mind was made up. When the song finished, he would stop. Perhaps he had overlooked something in his pack and there was water at hand after all. It had been such a long time since he had looked in there anyway, he couldn't rightly recall. Of course, he hated his pack. It reminded him of her, that damn perfume bottle that had shattered inside. There was nothing he could do to get rid of the smell. Other things about it jogged his memory, but he had no choice. He needed to drink. Definitely, when the song ends, he thought again. Would the song ever end? If he was going crazy, could he not keep that song repeating inside his head forever, or at least until he dropped dead from exhaustion, exposure, or starvation? The thought of death, his own death, had crept into his mind and savagely grabbed hold. But only for a moment, as his boot struck something hard that made a hollow oaken clumping sound. The music had stopped, and so had Kelly. He found himself in the midst of this wild desert terrain, standing atop a large wooden door. Binky Turpin shifted in his chair. His legs had fallen asleep again, and so had his butt. As he pulled his back flush with the seat, he glanced briefly downward at the computer monitor. The cursor pulsed. The rest of the screen was blank, as usual. He turned his attention back to the screen above the monitor and used the remote control to rewind. He had missed the beginning of the best scene. Damn! Binky Turpin had fallen into this job quite by accident, but nothing, and he meant nothing, would make him give it up. Basically, he sat in an uncomfortable chair, this was the only drawback, in front of a computer monitor that did nothing but show a blinking cursor 24 hours a day, 7 days a week, while on a television screen above, a non-stop stream of pornographic videos allowed him to masturbate his shift away. His contract was for four years, 
and he had only a short time left until it was up. It was an easy job. As long as the cursor continued to blink, he had absolutely nothing whatsoever to do. The cursor had done nothing but blink since the power to the computer was turned on nearly 43,000 years ago. Binky's other computer interfaced with the mainframe in the outer continents. Anything he typed into the supply list would be processed and instantly teleported to his chamber, within reason, of course. On Binky's fourth day on the job, he had tried to teleport mass quantities of drugs and a few of his closest friends. After two days, his superiors had somehow found out, and all had been sent away. He now has an ongoing list of items the computer is not allowed to provide, including access to 900 numbers. After almost four full years alone in front of the screen, the only thing Binky asked for these days were meals and new pornos as they were released. He could hardly wait until his job was history, and he could leave with his full wages intact. Since there was nothing to actually spend his money on and all his needs were met, you wouldn't think it would be too difficult of a thing to do. But then, Binky Turpin was not the smartest kid on the block. Other people had used this time to read the classics, meditate, or maybe write that great novel they never had the chance to get around to. Not Binky. He was a man of simple needs, and right now, he needed to watch this scene again. Binky had the film back to where he wanted it. It was his favorite part of the movie, where Lusty Throat Taker, the sex goddess of all United Core Planet, was having her body invaded by three brawny young men. Unfortunately, that was the exact moment that all hell broke loose. The Reality Controller Computer, or RC2000, basically measures any and all gaps and overlaps in reality in and around the 56 known planes of existence. It was created a long, long time ago, during the population explosion of 386. At that time, there had only been three planes of existence, namely the earthly, spiritual, and demonic ones. Interaction between the three was quite rare. In fact, the much publicized event where Snickerous Wiltbottom the Pure accidentally opened a gateway to the demonic plane that allowed four very horny demons onto Core Planet was the only known occurrence of this. The demons had seduced a great percentage of the population before Kingston's set of Arachnus and his small band banished them back to their own world and locked the gate after them. The children of women used by the demon led to the beginning of most evil in the world as well as PMS. The men who had been so taken had formed babies in their stomachs, which could be the reasons for the offspring's sour disposition, and birthed them out their asses. These children eventually grew up to create a new form of evil called politicians. By 386, the universe in which Core Planet is the center had become so crowded that it was necessary to punch through to parallel dimensions. It had been discovered that the realities in these new places were not exactly the same as in the Core. Reality was determined by what existed on Core Planet. Many of the things found on alternate planes neither did nor could exist on Core. Items brought back home by the first interplanet explorers either disappeared or changed radically. The beautiful multicolored long stem flowers known as Ryothas on the plane of Silton became common daisies when retranslated on the Core. A new species of dog discovered on Zolrat 6 changed to orange broomsticks that barked when you swept. Concepts and ideas also underwent peculiar transformations, as, if you keep listening, you shall hear. For a time, beings were allowed to move freely between worlds. Then, the destruction of Lurth by the Yadakians forced the locking of all gateways. Actually, it wasn't really the Yadakians' fault at all. Lurth was just the last straw. It wasn't long after that the people of Core Planet got two particularly powerful computers to mate, which was no easy task, let me tell you, and the birth of the RC-2000 in 534. The computer made sure the existing doors stayed shut and no random holes were breached. It was one person's job to monitor the computer and deal with any problems. That person was armed with the RC-2000 itself, as well as the 10,000-page manual titled How to Keep Reality Real, a basic user's guide to the RC-2000. That person was elected every four years. That person was expected to be one of the most intelligent of Core Planet's population. That person had to understand all the terrible implications of reality overlaps. Most importantly, that person had to know how to deal with and resolve any and all predicaments that presented themselves during his term. And that person had to do it alone. That person was, purely by some horrible mistake in personnel back at the home office, probably involving in-laws, at least for the next three months, Binky Turpin. 
Binky was at the brink of culminating his enjoyment of the scene on the screen before him when he realized he was getting a crick in his neck. This was because his head was positioned for viewing about eight feet higher than it was used to. He glanced down about three feet to where the TV screen usually poured out its erotic images, and to his amazement, he saw that the computer monitor had enlarged to encompass this area. Binky's already slack jaw dislocated, and his eyes bugged out. Apparently the monitor had not finished its transmortification. It continued to grow and widen in silent lurches. The now forgotten television fell off onto the floor with a crash. The picture went black, but the sound became a blare of post-coital oohs and ahs intermixed with a lot of erotic murmurings. Binky sat staring, his erection deflating in his hand, as the monitor slowly became six and one-half feet high and three and one-half feet wide. It scraped the ceiling of Binky's office as it bounced precariously on the tiny desk. The blank screen was now replaced with a swirl of color that eventually became a rich, deep brown. The cursor that had normally just hung out in the middle of the screen, but had, last week, moved to the top left corner and then just yesterday to the middle of the bottom, slid to the middle of the right side and bulged grossly out of the screen until it resembled a doorknob. That's it, Binky thought. The monitor has become a giant door. His face scrunched into a nervous grin as he started to draw in a deep breath for what would surely have been the most wonderfully satisfying sigh of relief when the computer-slash-door swung violently open and Binky found himself no longer alone. Sand sprinkled over Binky in a thin silken mist. He had to squint as a sun he had not seen for nearly four years except on television poured its severe brightness through the doorway and into his retinas. Also, an overwhelming odor of sweat, salt, and sand attacked his nasal cavities, causing his already crinkled face to collapse inward and attempt to fend off the affronting sense. There was a man in the doorway. He couldn't really see him because of the violent blaze of sunlight behind him, but he could hear him. The man was screaming. The scream sounded startled and terrified. Binky wondered why the man was yelling like that when he realized there was another noise in the room as well. The noise sounded surprisingly similar to the first screaming, only it was in a slightly higher timber. It wasn't until the man in the brand new entrance slammed the door shut and Binky had a chance to calm down that he decided that the other scream had been his own. My God, thought Binky, so that's what happens when there are reality gaps. Holy shit, he breathed, his own voice strangely unfamiliar to him. He would have to do something immediately. He surveyed the damage. His television lay on its side on the floor, quiet, for the film had run out. The computer-slash-doorway was just a computer monitor again with a blank screen, except for the blinking cursor, which was now at the top, and followed by a single sentence, which read, There has been a gap in reality at coordinates V3, W17, X987686, Y635, Z9. Binky swiveled his chair around so he was facing the teleporter computer. He snuck one more peek back to survey the damage. He knew what needed to be done with all the assurance his brain could muster. He typed three words with his keypad, pressed send, and waited. These words were, need new TV. That was chapter one of Madcap. Hope you enjoyed it. If you did, like, share, and subscribe to my YouTube channel. I got the first five chapters up on YouTube. And if you want to hear any more than that, check out my Patreon page. You know the way that works. I got all sorts of things on there. Uh, books, short stories, poetry, everything.